the halls with boughs of holly. La 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 la. Tis the season to be jolly. La 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 la. Don we now our gay apparel. Spend your holidays at the Blazing Saddle. Open 365 days a year, always a double, never a cover. I started in 1983. Back in the day when all the bars, the only thing they cared about is their own money. And I wanted to make a difference. I love this bar. It's my home. It's my friends. It's a good place to come and hang out and know that you're okay, that you're loved. I probably could have a bitch about everybody, but all in all, they're, everybody's really good people and it's been a blessing that I even got asked to work here. I owe this bar a lot, really I do. It's such a hometown bar that anyone can come to. Gay, straight, bi, whatever. It doesn't matter who you are, it's just, just come down here and hang out, and that's what's so great about it. We're always open. We're open every day. If you need somewhere to go at some point, or just need to get away, or whatever, regardless of the day, we're here for you. This is a welcoming place for anyone. Straight. You, you can be straight, but you have to realize that this is a gay bar, and if you're coming in, then you have to respect that that's what it is, and accept what you see and the people that are here. And that's what makes you feel um, Secure, I guess, anyway. I remember just being a kid, actually. My dad used to manage a shop across the street. And as a teenager, I remember looking across to the bar going, I want to go there someday. It was the first place that I actually had gone to that um, I walked in, immediately met people instantly, and started talking to them. And it was like I'd been here 10 years. So it was like my first night here was like, wow, I am actually met new people. and continue those friendships and some of those friendships are still even existent today. So it's like after all those years it was still like coming home. And this bar is the cornerstone of the city. Everybody knows it is. It, it creates family, it supports family, it's one big, big family. We're not like a stereotypical bar. We have every type of individual we could possibly think of as right. we talked right. about, you and know, and we do every kind of possible event that we could think of yeah. and we're just so well rounded that we're just, we're not the gay bar or the queer eye for the straight yeah, guy. Yeah, the show. drag bar or the leather bar yeah. or the lesbian bar. We're or the, the everybody's yeah. bar. bar. Yeah. We're the people's bar. Yeah. I wanted to be more active. That's why I came up with Cataclysmic, so I could be more involved in things that go on here. The definition of Cataclysmic is, or, or yeah, Cataclysmic with C's, is um, to bring about a fundamental change. And really, that was my inspiration of starting female impersonation. So it really just kind of worked out really well. I did a lot of research on different forms of names and for some reason that one just was perfect. So especially when I read the definition, I was like, yes, perfect. So that's what I want to do, bring some change. And I think more than any place, any other little gay bar I've ever seen, this bar is dedicated to community service. It is something that, that Mongo or Bob has instilled in in you know in the bar and all of us and that's why that's why we're such an incubator for so many so many fundraising or nonprofits or fundraising organizations and I have tried to instill in people and groom people to get into charities to get working with gay pride other organizations so long after I'm history my work will continue through other people I'm one of those, I'm a working owner. I'm not one of those, I'm just gonna sit back and count my cash owners. <laughs> Where I used to work before I worked here at the Saddle, um, I worked at a mail order pharmacy and I was the computer help desk. And so I had a tendency to swear a lot because everybody, when you're the computer help desk, everybody calls at the same time with the same problem. All the computers, because the, the programmers have done something, so. Um, and it's always something simple like they're redoing this or did you turn your computer on or all this. So I swore 
swore a lot and I said, fuck you and fuck this and fuck that. And so I changed it to this stinks and that stinks and you stink and then it just kind of backfired. And so then I became stinky after that. So, and that's how stinky started and it stuck with me. And I fought it for years and then I just accepted it for what it was. So it's a term of endearment. Jerry Edward Bird. My drag name, a.k.a. is Phenomet Fat Pussy. Phenomet is guaranteed to give an easy ride. The fat pussy is what will happen after that. Get it? Because Stinky and I used to bartend. The bar owner here, Stinky. He and I used to bartend another bar down around the corner. We used to drink back then. And then one night we got fired. We were both drinking behind the bar. And apparently the owner had someone come in <laughs> that was undercover, solving that mystery. And he said, I heard you've been giving out free shots. And I looked at Sneaky, Sneaky looked at me, and I said, most certainly have. <laughs> he goes, get out. I'm like, can we have our tips? <laughs> He's like, get out. And then Sneaky come down here and took over. And didn't offer me a job or nothing. Didn't. Bird, can't stand the bitch. I really can't. I used to be the MC. I had my own show. <laughs> that was every third Tuesday. But then I invited my sister Muffy, my best friend, bitch. <laughs> so obviously you don't know who the hell I am. No, I don't. And I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm not a I'm the mistress of the saddle. And she kind of just took over the whole thing. But that's because she's, you know, She's a lot better than me. She can paint her own face. I don't paint my face. I don't do any of that crap. Why do it when you have other people to do it for you? That's what I'm saying. Hey, hey Stinky and Chris and I'm a big dog, but I just like to refer to myself as the head bitch. Bevy Rosenberg wasn't my original drag name. My original drag name was really stupid. But I was so preppy that when I came into the bar, everyone yelled out Muffy anyway. It was kind of like Norm. <laughs> But it was Muffy. And so when I performed, I was trying to be Tiffany Cannon and they all yelled out Muffy anyway, so I thought, why fight it? And Rosenberg was my grand... And, well, you try to mix something with Muffy. But Rosenberg was my grandmother's maiden name, so I just put the two together and done. My first experience here was as a patron a long time ago, and I was just coming out at the age of 30. And back then it was more of a men's bar, more of a tough leather bar, a very male dominated crowd. And so I came here, but it wasn't as comfortable for me back then. I came here, so that would have been um, 85, a little unlegal, but I came in and I would not, I, I could not be served. Honest, I came in the front doors and, and I remember the guy saying, woman, you're not gonna get served, you're not gonna get served, you're not gonna get served. And I, 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 I don't know, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes, I refused to let go. Long story short is, after I graduated, I still came back. I still went to the garden, I still gave the blazing saddle, and it was a different staff at that time. In the 84, 86, 88, it was a different era. And they didn't really like us women out and about. But I didn't give up on this bar. Then I had a bartender by the name of John. And he was all attitude. I wanted to do a women's night or a women's day. And he absolutely hated lesbians and her women and a form, shape, whatever. He wouldn't serve them. I kind of walked by in the barn and said, look, boy, you want a paycheck from here. These are my friends. You're going to serve them. It's a, it's a myth. And the thing is, the women just didn't choose to come here at first. And slowly and then steadily, now they're here. But that's one thing that Bob's all, Mongo has always instilled in everybody is that everybody's welcome. You know, gay, straight, male, male female, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. So... So he always has kind of put his foot down that everybody's involved, not just not just the boys, not just the girls. Oh, like a place for everybody. Yeah, like a dear old friend of mine, Jose, God rest his soul, 
founder of the Imperial Court once said, we can all hang together or you can all hang on separate ropes. I'd rather bring my whole community together. I moved here because I, I went through a, a really bad relationship and I needed to, I needed to, to move and this seemed like a great place to come because I already had friends here, I had established friendships here and I was ready for a change in my life. And the saddle was the saddle in Des Moines, Iowa, were the change I needed. Born and raised in Las Vegas, I never really thought much about Des Moines. So, my ex was in the Air Force, came out to visit his parents and work on their house, and went to the state fair and came down the saddle. As soon as I got down here, I met Chris Ann, then James, then Stinky, <laughs> and became friends with them. I'd lost my job in Vegas. Jeff was getting out of the Air Force. He was from here, and we decided to move out here. <laughs> we broke up, and I stayed. We used to go to the garden. Well, at that point, it was the brass garden. Before and so, and that was kind of the place to be, and that's where we all went. And we had started out early on a Saturday night, or Saturday afternoon-ish, before they opened, and we thought, well, we'll just stop at the saddle. And so we did, and we came to the door, and everybody rubbernecked around like they always do, and we still do it today. Now I'm just used to it. And we kind of ordered a drink and then stood against the wall and finished it and looked around for a while and hit it. And then I didn't come here for a few years because I was scared of it. <laughs> it's scary. It was an old man's bar back then. And that's when I was young. And just like Bird said, that, you know, now we're the old man. So that's why we have more fun. Started in December. Uh... 19 years ago, going on 20 years, so, yeah, I worked uh, at the Garden nightclub, and I come in here after I got off work and have a drink, and Greg Nelson, who's the manager here, asked if I wanted to fill in while one of the bartenders went on vacation. So I did that for one week, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays was the shift, and the guy never came back. <laughs> well, long before I ever was here, I've been doing drag for over 30 years. I have over like 18 or 19 titles. Of course, my saddle is one of the most coveted ones. But I, when I first started performing, I didn't even speak on the microphone. I was too shy. And eventually I just had to get over that and tell myself that I could do that. And alcohol helps. Right, girl. Right, girl. I remember um, I worked a Tuesday night. Um, there was some stuff that went on um, with a staff member. Um, just something that just happened and they needed me to fill in and I just fell in. But I, I have done that filling in just whether it was an hour here or there. So they asked me to fill in for a shift. I did it and um, long story short, this person couldn't um, do his job, and so I took over his position, and I love it. We came up on Halloween, high holiday, and they were just overwhelmed. They didn't have anybody working the front of the house. The bar back couldn't get out from behind the bar to collect glasses. They were running out of glasses, so I just stood up and started helping. And that was kind of how I started working here. And then after that, when I was down here, if they were busy, I would just pick up the front of the house and do anything they asked me to do. And I kind of did that for no compensation whatsoever from October, like I said, of 2009 through June of 2010. And they knew that I had been doing it for free forever. And they said, do you want to work here? And I said, sure. When I started at Saddle, it was actually uh just rewiring TVs to clean up the signal. Then there was a hum in the sound system, so I found a broken cable, fixed that. Wound up becoming a DJ. You know, bartending's not just serving drinks, it's also, a sh you know, a show for the people, for the customers that are here, and um, you gotta do that. So I give them a different flair in what I wear, or should I say not wear. I have done shows here off and on since the very beginning. I used to live in Omaha, 
And when Bob Mongo started the first All the Way AIDS benefit, I was one of the headline performers for it. And hence, after a period of time, I moved here about, I think, 15 years ago and became Miss Saddle and then just kind of became show director and, and kind of became the, the voice of the Saddle shows. Sometimes I'm the boss, sometimes I'm the bouncer, sometimes I'm the fix-it person, fixing the toilet in the middle of the night, getting new toilet paper. Uh, sometimes I'm the person who's the concierge, calling a cab, calling the hotel service. Um, sometimes I'm your safety patrol, getting people home, getting them a glass of water, getting them to let their night down easy. And so my job is so multifaceted. I'm not just the bouncer. I'm not just the person who cleans up the front of the house. I'm kind of the jack of all trades. I just won this year, runner up to least, uh, bar, least addressed bartender in the city of Des Moines, uh, was runner up behind a, a woman. So, you know, it was, uh, I, I guess that, that's an achievement. I'm a barback. All I do is run and really I run and you guys are always in my way and I'm like <laughs> get out of my way. You know, leather weekends, one year I wore a rope outfit. All I had was 300 feet of bondage rope tied around my body. Back in 83 I had bars on all the windows. Every bartender had a can of pepper spray and it got rough. Straights would come in, uh, I want a piece of some fag and well, there'd been many times I'd have to jump up and put them in their place. There was a lot less of me and I was a lot wirier. We used to have these things here called lockdowns. And it was a Chicago thing. And we got kind of got involved with this um, troop out of Chicago that would, and they would do these out there and it was perfectly legal. And they would, so we decided we'd try it here. It was called a lockdown. And you'd buy tickets and it was basically a private party. And so, anyway, it was the strip troop would come through, and they would, there would be so many of them. We'd get food and whatever, and people would have buy tickets, and then we'd lock it down when it started. It went on for like three hours or so, and uh, so they would come out and perform and what have you. And and uh, so it was towards the end of one, and people would get, you know, we'd have food, so people wouldn't get too drunk and those types of things and then it got a little rare in here and um, so and this you'll ask anybody and, and they'll tell you the story who was involved in it um, but anyway this one kid got a little bit overly drunk and he got up on stage this is towards the end of the party and uh, got up on stage and had a corona bottle and one of the strippers put the corona bottle up his ass <laughs> <laughs> and then pulled it out and then of course there was a little of spillage involved um, so yeah so that was a big joke for a while about the whole corona bottle thing ask anybody about the corona bottle but as soon as they hit the saddle they stop here they stay here and by the end of the night, you can't get through. And it's kind of funny because it's all the straight guys that come in and they just have like a blast. They would never come to a gay bar any other time except with their girlfriends and girls on that night. And I've seen some try to get naked. Not that I mind seeing it, can't really let it happen. But it's always a good night. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always a great weekend. I used to clean the bar for five years, and there was this period of time where people decided that they needed to shit on the floor next to the toilet. Versus, remember that time? It was like five times in like two year or in like two weeks period. Seriously, every time I went to go clean the bathroom, there was a pile of shit right next to it. And I didn't know if someone was playing a joke on me or what it was. Latin nights, it's, it's kind of like old school gay bar because we used to get really dressed up back in the 80s. And we get dressed up and we go out and whatever. And so, and the Latin kids, they get all dressed up now. And the girls wear heels all the time and, you know, short skirts. And the guys, you know, put on their best shirts and come out. 
And so and this is some lesbian, she somebody looked at her girlfriend wrong. Or, no, I think stepped on her shoes. She had new shoes. Somebody stepped on them. She got mad about it. And then this place, the dance bar was frickin' packed. And she she picked up a glass and hit somebody upside the head. And then bottles were flying and this and that and the other. So we, we cleared out this side a little bit early. Shut the music down. Got them out of here. And then uh, they ended up, how it worked was, she ended up across the street and, and she got beat up kind of bad. Not by any of our people, but by the, some of the other Latin kids that were, she had pissed off. We're very community oriented and that's what holds us together. We're all a bunch of misfits that work here. We're, you know, not. <laughs> You get us all separate and we're just a bunch of freaks, but you get us all together, we're family, and we take care of our own, and we take care of our customers, and we take care of our bar, and we, you know, make sure that everybody has a good time and treats others decently. It's not that we're a big bar, it's that we care. We have a big heart. And I think it's amazing when you're actually in a business that allows for organizations to come in and raise money for the community it just it creates a different feel about that business and you have a different loyalty to it and i think that that is part of the reason the saddle customer base is so strong and so continual is because they realize the bar has a heart and the people that work here have a heart and they actually care about the people that we serve and the people in our community i think that makes a world of difference in business it's just awesome to feel like really wanted. And, and, and this bar has given me a part-time job. I love it. I love the people I work with. I love the people that take care of people. The thing about the saddle is the people here really care about each other. If one of them's hurting, yeah, we might talk about it for a minute. <laughs> we might, you know say some things we probably shouldn't say, but when it comes down to it, they help each other out. And that's all that matters. One community coming together. Robert Jeffrey Eigelberry, AKA Mongo. This started before the movie. It was back in junior high when I wrestled. And it just stuck. And then when we got the bar, aim it after yourself. And I went, Mongo's? No, Blazing Saddle. And I went, like that idea. I went in in about uh, early 69, operations intelligence, reconnaissance sergeant, 631st, 9th Infantry Division, Main Kong Delta. I was very lucky. I went over as infantry and was scheduled to go to the bush. And anybody who was anybody, I kept saying, I can type, I can type. Back then, not very many people could type, especially men. Uh, you know, today, everybody keyboards. But back then, that was kind of rare. I ended up getting a job in the education center for division headquarters in Chu Lai, uh, division headquarters for uh, AmeriCal Division, 23rd Infantry Division. And uh, so I lucked out there. Now, it's very important to say that, yeah, we had gays in the military. We still do. We always have had. We had, I had a few experiences there, you know, I mean, you meet somebody in the shower late at night or something like that that was haphazard, but by and large, there wasn't a whole lot that I was familiar with anyway. And I know a lot of the kids that have gone in and are going in now that are, <clears throat> times have changed, but really, when you're in a combat situation, if you protect your brother, he protects you, nobody really cares. I went in here, I had a sponsor at the time that fronted the money, but the license and everything has always been my name. And it just, it was a, a work in progress, if you will. We were kind of a country western leather Levi type bar. Being a senior member of the Cornhollers, another brother of mine had the barn door. Well, he knew he had to move, so we wanted this. I have been the owner on paper ever since day one. I was renting the building off of him at a ridiculous price. 
and I wasn't getting paid anything. And then there was all sorts of money going out under the table to keep Lacage going and to give him more money. And I'm sitting here working overtime to keep beer in the bar. Because back then I really wasn't hands-on as far as the money went. I was kind of the front man. We started the uh, first Gay Pride, and it was just four of us walked up the uh, courthouse, walked back and drank about it, and then it just blossomed and growed. And the saddle has always been, I've said it forever, where pride starts and it stops. All the organizations come to us for our leadership, and we've supported pride since day one. And 97 Pride Inc. was created, and I'm Pride for the last 14 years from 87 to 2000. Well, then I had a friend and a club brother with the corn haulers, JR. He had a bar around the corner, and it was less than a toilet, if I will. <coughs> anyway, he lost his business, so I hired him as a bartender. Well, his big, he had AIDS, and his big dream in life was to be an owner. So, dumb shit here, I made him an owner. No money, never put a dime into it. But then he, oh, he tried to grow bigger. We had the side saddle cafe on the other side of me, and then we had a consignment shop on this side. It's where I am. Right here. Well, that was all well and good. But more money was going out of the back door than I could bring the product in the front door. In other words, a lot of thievery going on. Yeah, let's go to 1993. The year that will live in infamy. The state has gotten almost five more inches of rain. Reservoirs have filled to overflowing. Rivers and streams have spilled out of their banks, crushed levees, driving thousands of people out of their homes and businesses, and contaminated the water supply in Des Moines. Can't take it anymore. It's there. Later, at the site of a massive volunteer effort to reinforce a levee around the Des Moines water plant, the president couldn't resist the temptation to be photographed filling his own sandbag. Business losses continue to mount. The business district resembles a ghost town. The manager of this Marriott expects his hotel will lose $300,000 by the time it reopens next Monday. We had more water than we knew what to do with. They thought Sailorville might break a dam. So I got worried and I started taking everything out of the basement and moving it up. Then I got really worried and we took it all the way upstairs. Well, lo and behold, that one night, infamous night in June, I come down after work and on the news bulletins, we're losing water. The Des Moines Water Works shut down. Yep. So we filled everything we had up. I called my mother, told her to fill everything. and. Filled everything I had at home. So I get down here Sunday morning. Then I thought for all the five minutes, oh God, we've got to shut her down. I have never shut for any reason that I can remember. So by God, we opened the bar up, went out and got canned pop and bottled water. Then I bring in potable water for coffee and so forth and so on. Well, since toilets don't work, this is where it got fun. We developed a potty patrol. Every building on Locust was uh, pumping water out of their basements. They go over and get five gallons. Then we held the saying, if it's yellow, let her mellow. If it's brown, flush her down. And my God, we were the hub of the whole East Village. It was the only place to drink. It was the only place to get something to eat. So we just pressed on through like we always do. Well, in 94, <clears throat> this is when the taxes hadn't been paid, blah, blah, blah. 
We had to make cash payments on everything. And JR's family stepped in and I borrowed four or five thousand just to pay off the IRS or keep them off my neck for a little while. I started and I started uh, just working Saturdays. Yep. Saturday afternoons is my big deal. And I was, we were all, we were all part of the court. We were all this and that and the other. And uh, so yeah, so and I kind of built up the Saturday afternoons and they were kind of fun anymore. And, and I just, I didn't have anything else to do. So I picked up every, every random shift I could possibly get until I weaseled my way in. Build them up, hell. <laughs> you took them from shit all the way up. Some, for some reason, everybody likes his smart-ass personality. Because he can dish it as well as give it. And then it wasn't long, a uh, guy by the name of Greg was, was manager at the time. Yeah, now this is that. an interesting story. I knew him back. I knew him back off, yeah, yeah, I knew him back in the disco days, and I thought, "Wow, he's a businessman. He's going to really, really help." Yeah, he sure did, didn't yeah, he? He sure helped. Oh, yeah, yeah he, helped uh, himself. <laughs> he just hired me out of the blue, and uh, just to fill in because these are his shifts that he was supposed to work, and he didn't want to work them. He didn't want to so do shit. He's got somebody to get behind the bar and do it. For yeah. At that point, Bob was working every day. He was working at uh, American National Can, and I was here every day because this was this was my job. Yeah. And to keep the place open. And it was uh, not always the easiest thing to do. We were popular because... because nothing it was, was here. Of, nothing was here, and it was underground. And so we were busy all the time, and people didn't feel like they could go just anywhere and to be in a gay bar to be comfortable being gay so we were still we were fairly busy most of the time and uh, so due to that fact we made it through this whole issue and uh, it wasn't much longer after we paid that off this whole like extra tax issue that we dealt with the state and they were happy with us and we were happy with them and everybody's happy and then we had got to be able to put some money in the bank I remember I got a call one time night at night my well my boyfriend at the time he was the one who who answered the phone and he says uh he says well he says somebody was just on the phone they said, they said the bar's on fire i said what and i pushed him out of the way and i got in the car and i came down here and lo and behold the they're pulled around the corner and there were fire trucks galore and people standing outside of the saturday night and people standing outside wondering what to do and uh, looking around and so, and it was this side, it was where we are now, the dance bar side that had caught on fire this before we owned these buildings. And there was an electrical fire and it was all the GLRC stuff and whatever that got smoke damage and we got smoke damage in the main bar and water damage and there is an apartment upstairs that this great big fat woman lived up there and so she had a bunch of rabbits and oh birds Christ. and what have you and they all most of them died in the smoke and got her out of here and it was a big ugly mess. I was down here I have to work 11 o'clock and one of the other bar owners it was her birthday so I went over and had a drink with her and happy birthday happy birthday and I'm walking back and somebody goes Mongo we smell smoke so I went through the basement then I went upstairs and downstairs and it just got worse. And then smoke rolled out of the fucking front of the building. So I call the fire department. And I walk in here and use my big boy voice. Ladies and gentlemen, you will now exit the bar. This is a fire, not a drill. You will go across the street and stay the hell out of the way. Just like high school. Everybody picked a drink up. Right across the parking lot, stayed out of the fireman's way. And the fire missed this room uh, right next door here, went from the basement and shot upstairs up the wall. Created a hole about five foot around yep. that the fireman didn't want to jump over. So since we weren't working at the bar, Beasley and I at the time, and why the fireman did it, I don't know. They had Brian and I jump over the five foot hole. 
And so the firemen are on the safe side of the hole. Beasley and I are in his living room, what's now his living room, and we're looking at 28 dead birds and we're looking at about 20 rabbits and rabbit poop all running all over. The birds died, the rabbits lived. The rabbits got down low and missed the smoke inhalation, and so all, all these rabbits are alive. So what do the firemen have us do is gather up all the rabbits, hand them over the five-foot hole to the firemen, and then when we finally scoop up all the rabbits and have rabbit poop and pee all over us, then the firemen help us back over the five-foot yeah. hole. And it's like... How that happened, right. I'll never know. But Jared I, was but out front oh my God! Crying. And Gary, oh. Gary and Jerry bought Beasley and I a drink <laughs> when we were done. <laughs> we couldn't get the gal out upstairs, so this big lesbian busts the door down, walks up, gets her. So finally got everybody out. and got police. The police left, and the firemen left, and blah blah blah, and left us here at the mess, which is what they do because that's not their job. And we were open the next day? Yes, we were. We opened, we opened the next day. We closed a little early that night because of the fire. And it wasn't long after that that the guy who owned this building, where we are in the dance bar, and then the next building where where Patrick's makeup shop is and the parking Park lot on the side, called us up and said, would you be interested in buying that? Before we put a dime into this place, we used to have a head building inspector Bill, mm -hmm. love the man, too bad he retired. We called him down and had coffee and said, Bill, this is what we want to do. And he said, okay, I'll help you work through everything. And he took us through every stinking step we needed to go through. Mm -hmm. Well, then we, we wanted to just buy the whole thing outright, but they didn't want to. They wanted to put a payment plan so they wouldn't get hit with taxes. We opened the site on a Labor Day weekend. Friday of Labor Day weekend, and I was right up until, right up until Friday of that weekend getting our uh, liquor license. And it was we funny as hell it. because we called up Bill, the inspector. He walked through, stood on the dance floor, got on his cell phone, called two of the city council members, and he said, "Mongo's totally approved. He opens tonight." This side, I mean, this side has been a good ass. Oh yeah, it has absolutely. So it was, it was, it. The main bar was too small for what we would try to do, so that's basically why we added this side was for the overflow, and uh, and it flew, it flowed. Oh, and then we accidentally received a letter from the city. They were going to demolish everything down here. This is just so you know. This is going back a little bit, and this was back in probably '98 is when we got this letter from the city um, that was supposed to go to Richard, who they thought owned, who owned yeah. the buildings. And we got a letter that said that they wanted to um, demolish this entire block and start over. And they were going to do this Eastern Gateway and Western Gateway issue. And um, so we headed off this, this letter and talked to some of our neighbors at the time, and we started going to City Hall all the time. All they had the every time. meeting that they had and every time it came up and then um, so they realized that there are actually people down here. Oh and, the city uh, got so damn mad at seeing me and Brian at every yeah. damn thing. So and they ended up putting me on the steering committee for the Eastern Gateway and Western Gateway and uh, that was that was around ninety nine ish and um, then that's when that's about when city ordinance came out protecting gays and lesbians. Yep. Yeah. Um, but the funny part, when we started going to those meetings, there were four bozos on the commission. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm an old east sider and I'm a mouthy son of a bitch. I got up and said, hey, where are you from? Urbandale, Windsor Heights, Clyde. And I said, isn't it lovely that the suburbanites are coming to the east side telling us how to run our business? Get the hell back to your suburbs. And the whole place stood and started clapping. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, and it did. And it was And good. that commission was kind of demolished. I'm trying to accommodate a new generation of gay and lesbian people. 2002, this site yeah, opened. Right. And then um, at that point, we were kind of known as a man's bar, or as an old man's bar. And. Uh, so we kind of 
made an issue about bringing some more youth over here, so we made a really cheap night, and we called it Tear It Up Tuesdays, and that's where Tear It Up Tuesdays came from. Um, and since then, you know, they they had their heyday, and they, they kind of uh, wax and wane on these, th on these things, but, uh, but since then, we've gotten a whole lot more women, we've got a whole lot more youth in here. I mean, you can walk in here and see anywhere from 21 to 80 81, yeah. you know, and they'll be sitting next to each other having a conversation. I would say now we're probably 70, 30, 65, 35, yay. We are the biggest collage of... Yeah, we're a melting pot. We're the biggest bunch of misfits ever, but but uh, works together and everybody still likes to come here and, uh, you know, it's it's what we've made it. It's what's, what was, I think it was your vision. I don't know if it was Yes, it not, was. But, yes, it was. But I think we've tried to make it that way. I keep reinvesting the money to make the property better. And then people that are around you see that and they try to spruce up. Every flower down here on East 5th bought and paid for by me, not the city. I like to enhance everything for the village. And I've sponsored, uh, or helped sponsor Art Stop. And they went, well, why? You have nothing to do with art. And I went, I embrace the arts, and if it's good for the village, it's good for me. We always help out with the Susan B. Coleman run. Why? Because cancer. And you're able to help other people out. You know, like I say, embrace everybody. It's kind of interesting how from 30 years ago, there were two bartenders and one side bar that was so packed that we were breaking the occupancy oh limit God, every single that one weekend to two sides. Now we're half gay, half straight on a Saturday night. We're more community. We're more defined. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to admit, don't ask, don't tell pretty much what shoved us right out there. Like I said before, I'm kind of the old man out of the whole thing. And some of the stuff we did over here was geared more to the kids. But I, I learned really quick, hey, adapt. Well, and you have to. Internet news feeds it was talking about 10 businesses that won't be around in the next 10 years. And well, Gay Bar was number one, eight, yeah. I think, on it. And that, I was really offended by the whole thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought, what the fuck's this supposed to mean? Because I'm not going to have a job. But, well, uh, what it means is but, that it won't strictly be a gay bar. Right, and what it right. meant was, you know, the weak ones will fall and then the other ones will stay around because you have to adapt to everything, which is, I think we've done that fairly well. We're here in the middle of everything. And, uh, we're, you know, the boy's over by itself and the garden's over by itself, so they still get their crowds, but they don't get the crowds that we do. Right. Because ours are way more mixed than theirs. Stinky started the Latino night, and I thought, that's not going to fly. Thursday night, they're straight and they're gay and everybody else. Most wonderful people you've ever worked with. Polite, polite, polite. And they really embrace the saddle, being a safe place to be. Now we help sponsor the uh, burlesque girls, bringing back an old art form. You know, and they are absolutely soul of the earth, too. It's these new young organizations, and we're here to help them. We give to Pride, and Pride's of course 501c3, that, you know, that doesn't head up out of here, but we're really involved in, in Pride and have been since the beginning of time. 26 years ago, I started the All Iowa AIDS Benefit, back when Ronald Reagan wouldn't even say the word AIDS. It was designed for direct service for clients. Back then, we were teaching people how to die with dignity, and now with the drug advancements, we're trying to teach them how to get back to work and be a productive part of society. I'm also the senior member of the Cornholers Leather Levi Club. Or, pardon me, we're a philanthropic group that gives to charities. I'm the founder of the um, Imperial Court of Iowa. I've been emperor twice, and it's my second term as president. The Imperial Court of Iowa was started here, well, basically started in, the, in this bar. And by, by patrons and regulars and, and owners of this bar. And I had the great fortune of becoming Empress 20 of the Imperial Court of Iowa. And along with my counterpart, Matthew, who is my emperor, 
We raised the most money we've ever raised. We raised over $85,000 for charity and almost every dollar of it was raised right inside these walls. Last year, the organization raised over $60,000 split between youth emergency shelters and reputable AIDS charities. 2004, <clears throat> the Historic East Village Association was started. Well, we were, there was like what, three businesses down here that started the whole yeah. thing, and it was to revitalize this area. <coughs> So Brian served on every stinking steering committee, and I served nine years as a board member. Yeah. And since then, everything has kind of grown up around us. Yeah. Um, and we're still here right in the middle of it. Over the years, the community service, the AIDS organizations, the food drives, the bake sales, the car washes, the flea market sales, anything to help raise money to give back to the community, that's what this bar is about, giving back because the patrons give so much to the bar. Without them, we wouldn't be anything. So you give back. I'm Alicia Manup. Yada Glitter Feather. And Persia Palms Fat Pussy. <laughs> <laughs> I was super fucked up one night, and I just came up with Lightly Shamana because it's hot and I'll tie somebody up. <laughs> I think it started two months ago. James Stevens' birthday, he wanted us to dress in drag, drag for, for his, his birthday. birthday. It wasn't even a show to begin no, with, it was no just going out. With. And then yeah. I don't know what happened. We we all went to Pride meetings. And I, I think, I, was it was me or you, it suggested, Somebody you know, did. let's make this into a show and make mm -hmm. some money for it. It was fun. It was a very intense two months. Mm -hmm. Practicing and just getting this shit together, and it'd be my only time ever doing well, it. I don't know. For real, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I've already cremated Yada Glitter Feather. Girl, they were not as needy as expected. Girl, they were drunken messes, but girl, that was fun. Well, I think that Yada Glitter Feather, or as I like to call her, Princess Pocahomo, was really kind of the standout in that show. Oh, she kind of tore the house down in her little jazz flats. I saw all my friends that I'd never seen do drag before actually get up on stage in women's clothes, which, well, they've never done that before. Did a great job and raised over 800 bucks. I thought Vegas had a big Halloween. Nothing like Des Moines. Halloween's, you know, one of our high holidays at the gay bars. It's gay Mardi Gras, and so, you know, it, that's that's one of our busiest nights of the year, so it's always cracking, which I like. I was the Bride of Frankenstein. It was different. How's it was that? fun. I'm not used to doing that kind of drag. I'm just all gray-faced and eyebrows up to my hairline or my lack of hairline. I like hockey, so Dean Lafleur has always been my alter ego, and since I busted my front teeth, it was just too much fun to have the hockey puck with my front teeth in it. Oh, I was Richard Simmons. I wasn't really happy with my outfit, but you know, normally I kind of go all out, but I didn't this year because that'd work. But I had the best shoes ever. They were glitter, silver glitter high tops. This was a very amazing Halloween. There were really great costumes. Uh, a lot of great people coming out. The superheroes were awesome. Although the costume contest was really good this year. You know, um, there were some really good entries. 
some old drag queen won, won best drag. Her name might be Mallory Moore, but she was painted up really good. She was painted up as the ghost of Marie Antoinette, which I thought was pretty clever. And I'm sure it was a random costume, but girl, she looked good. The little Barbie table, Barbie head was really cute, I thought. And the, the Geico guy I thought was fabulous. That was a lot of work. You know, to glue all those dollar bit, all that fake money to a bodysuit. I thought that was pretty brilliant. And the most brilliant all of, of course, was our own Ashley as Gollum. I mean, you can't beat that. <laughs> I mean, to embrace something that was kind of said behind her back for years. And then she, just, she embraced it and owned it. And it was phenomenal. The fact that he came out and had the balls to do that costume and do that, uh, I'll love him forever. I will love him forever just for having the balls to do that. The Michael Phelps twins were kind of cute. <laughs> I loved. We saw Oh, it. you know. <laughs> well, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't I? If you, if you had the opportunity. They're going to let me. I'm going to let. And usually they let me. It's good being the bitch. <laughs> it was fun to do it with Matt. That's always fun. His costume was probably the sickest thing all night. The referee for the National Water Sports League. And I don't mean water polo or swimming. Nasty. I mean, it just was a sea of people for, you know, a tiny little bar. We had a lot of people in here. I would say we were two or three people under the legal limit. <laughs> Of course we weren't over. Of course we weren't over capacity because Chris Brenner would never, Bulldog Brenner would never allow that to happen. Uh, what we just saw, basically, uh, they're a little over intoxicated, and um, the girl ordered a drink, a Coors Light, and it's something, or she had actually ordered a Coors Heavy, and we don't need to carry it. And whether the bartender understood what she ordered or not, uh, he brought her a Coors Light, she got offended by that fact. Um, the bartender basically told them that um, they owed us for the beer, and she didn't like that answer, and so then the boyfriend got offended as well, and um, said, no, it's time for you to go, because you're not going to pay me for the beer that you ordered, and she's like, I ordered a Coors Banquet. Well, I've worked here for four years, and I've never heard of a Coors Banquet, so, um, and I'm sure that our bartender hadn't either, and he just, uh, he asked them to leave, and they got really upset about it. He came out, and he was kicking at the bar window, and uh, the bar tender who was out here turned it over to Michelle and then um, he continued to be rather aggressive and so Michelle came and got me and by then uh, one of our regular patrons um, who does a lot of community work for the bar um, had gotten involved and was helping to defuse the situation but I'm always a little leery of that because that patron has had alcohol in their system as well um, top 10 reasons I don't drink when I work and it just, you know, if he was going to be violent, he was uh, saying that he wanted to throw a Molotov cocktail into the bar. And whenever anybody threatens violence, we get really um, concerned about that. And he accused us of being prejudiced to straight people. And I, I did laugh at him, and I probably shouldn't have. Um, but we are probably one of the most accepting bars out there as far as we don't care who you are. We just want you to come in and have a good time and treat everybody around you with kindness and respect. And when you don't do that, then it causes a problem. So um, he did ask to speak to a bar owner. It just so happens that uh, Brian slash Stinky was out here and he um, came and he talked to him and he took him back inside and whether he's giving him a refund and sending him on their way or whether he's uh, allowing them back in and getting them new drinks, I'm not sure. But whatever the case is, they seem happier and real satisfied and real calmed down right now. So we'll just keep an eye on them and we'll go from there. That's it. We really want this to be a safe place for everybody to come down and have a good time. And so I went over and when he pulled out, he just cut it too close and um, basically ripped the front off that car. And so we're looking for the owner. We haven't had much luck, but we'll keep looking and trying get them out here before the police leave 
and uh, feel sorry for that young guy, but he says he's only had one drink. He seems pretty straight up and down. He just made an error in judgment, made a big ass mess. So yeah, Saturday night was great. It was a lot of fun. We had some apple cider out there. It was spiked with some fireball and everyone seemed to enjoy that pretty good, keeping them warm, keeping them liquor. It was a good time. To me, it was way more for, for Mongo, for Bob, than anybody because he's been here. He opened the place. He's been here the whole time. He's seen all the ups and downs and we've had a lot of both. Um, but uh, I was glad we could make it, we could make it special for him. Happy 30 years, Blazing Saddle. Happy 30 years, Blazing Saddle. Happy 30th anniversary, Blazing Saddle. I'm glad I was here for almost 20 of them. Happy 30 years, Blazing Saddle. Happy 30 years, Blazing Saddle. Happy 30th! Happy 30 years, Blazing Saddle. Love ya. It's unaccustomed to public speaking as I am. <laughs> I would like to close with this. God bless America and ooga.